it's time to do the big thing and finally discuss the World Deco Hunters, baby. Welcome to Board Games on Toast. Hi, it's me, it's Toast. How are all you today? My cold is more or less gone. I feel slightly better, and if all things continue this way, I will be doing the voiceover for this video and not Mrs. Toast. I know, I know, we all miss Mrs. Toast. I miss Mrs. Toast. She's currently not in the house, but she will return in future videos. Of that, I am almost certain. I am so getting replaced by Mrs. Toast. Now, before we get into our deep dive of the World Deco Hunters, please consider leaving a like, a comment, and subscribing as it helps me fight against that dastardly YouTube algorithmic demon. If you want to help the channel out in a more tangible way, please consider signing up to my Patreon or my YouTube members to get some swanky perks like all of these cool people on screen right now. But without further ado, let's get on with the show. Groovy. Like in the last video and likely going forward, we are going to skip a lot of the guff that failed earlier videos. No pros, no cons, no spiel. It seems most people want to get right into the juicy COVID all and get to cheek clapping as soon as possible. So being a man of the people, here are the reactions or reaction singular. Smart Step Backwards is one of, if not the best, defensive reactions in the entire game. It's right up there with the quest of Soul Sworn and the Dispossessed as being just one of the best reactions in general, period. In short, this reaction lets your dude disengage after being stuck in melee. This means providing you can legally disengage, your opponent has to kill your models in a single attack action or you live. This is absolutely bonkers. You still take the full damage of the initial attack action and you absolutely can disengage from a weapon striking you at 2-3 to three inches, provided that is a melee attack like a spear or a flail for example. Defensively, this lets you stay alive a lot longer and fall back, potentially out of range of a follow-up attack from other models. Beyond that instant gratification of skirting death, you can also use it offensively to push onto objectives, reposition aggressively to get into position to clap something previously out of range, and all of that good stuff. Just remember, when you disengage, you must end out of engagement range. Now, this is one inch. You can end in melee combat range, which is two to three inches. This means spears can disengage out of combat and then on your turn attack since spears can attack outside of engagement. Basic stuff, but it's stuff that is easily forgotten, especially if you are new to disengaging as often as the Wildercore and the Hunters of Huanchi. If you want more information how this ability works and why, then I direct you to the legendary off meta musings and his video on the World of the Hunters and the Hunters of Huanchi. Nobody plays these factions better, so check out that for a real master's perspective. Be sure to come back though, I'll miss you otherwise. Now, the World Deco Hunters don't actually have any core ability. There is no ability that every model in the faction can actually use, but there are two that most of the faction can use, and that's good enough for me. And first up, we have Hunting Pack. This is a double and one that is very, very good, which is to be expected since Games Workshop have really pushed these new warbands to have very powerful and very cheap core abilities to really drive home a faction's theme and playstyle. Hunting Pack is a little bit wordy, but its effect is great. You pick a friendly fighter with the World Deco rune mark within 2 inches of the fighter using that ability. That targeted fighter can then make a bonus attack action. The only stipulations are that it must target an enemy within 2 inches of the fighter who initiated the ability. This is a very powerful way to get bonus attack actions. So good in fact that you will probably use this over Onslaught whenever the opportunity arises. You will soon see that we have a couple of units that are perfectly poised to benefit from this ability. It's super thematic to boot as you are literally just surrounding your targets and working together to cut them down. Your dudes aren't just humans after all, not lightning infused demi deities blessed by the divine. Your trailblazers with twin crossbows and the trog slayer spearmen love this as the spear has a range 2 and the twin crossbows have no minimum range. This allows them to fire 3 inches into melee combat whilst being completely immune to most reactions since they are, well, ranged attacks and not melee attacks. The only downside to this ability is the limitation on who can be targeted. Since you must target a Wildercore unit, you can't abuse it with allies, which is very important to note. 
Now, regroup is your quad and it is very interesting because it has no offensive element to it directly, which is very odd for a quad. How it works is everything with the will decor rune mark that you can see within 6 inches can either move or disengage. This kind of mass movement is always powerful, but it's also very situational. Movement is of course excellent for getting units into range of objectives, body blocking, disrupting and generally moving into combat. Disengaging forces your opponent to move back into range of your guys before attacking, making them harder to kill, especially since you can disengage again with your reaction if you really wanted to. There are very similar abilities on triples for allies, but considering this can be used by almost any model on the board, making every unit a potential battery for mobility, this is pretty darn awesome. A key thing to note is that the model using this ability does not get to move or disengage at all. This is because the ability states visible friendly fighters and as per the FAQ and errata, models are never visible to themselves. Now this does feel a little bit silly and it's not at all intuitive but it is what it is. Overall this ability is very situational but these kinds of situational abilities are inherently powerful because they give you a viable alternative to Rampage whilst you still retain access to Rampage in situations where mass mobility isn't actually required. With those core abilities down and out of the way let's have a look at the meat, the flesh sacks that make up the Wilder Core so we can see what we are working with on the tabletop. We start with the Warden who comes in three variations. Of the three, one is absolutely worthless, another is kind of okay and one is the thing you will take 90% of the time. Starting with the awful, we have the hunting crossbow variant. This guy is the most expensive whilst also bringing nothing of value to the table and I mean quite literally nothing of value at all. He is worthless. Defensively, he is the same as every other warden. He is very soft. Movement 4, toughness 3 and 20 wounds is very squishy even if he is only 120 points. Offensively, he is dreadful to the point of soul crushing. His melee profile is terrible and his range profile is no better. Now, he does have access to the Hunter's Eye Double, which is a very nice ability that increases the hit and crit of all attack actions he makes, even on his crossbow. But with only two attacks and crappy base damage, this doesn't make him at all worthwhile. Next, we have the Double Bited Axe variant, and this one actually has some play kind of, more so than the other guy at the very least. His melee profile is kind of okay for 115 points as he swings for 3424 and has access to Hunter's Eye which will bring him to 3435 which is rather nice. What holds him back is that you don't need a fighter with this damage profile since we have that elsewhere for cheaper as we will soon see and the Warden dies very quickly and has more uses if you take him in his final variant. And that is the Trail Hound variant. This guy has more attacks, less crit and less strength and loses out on Hunter's Eye. What he gets instead, however, is a very useful and archetype defining ability called Kill. Kill is a bit wordy again, but in short, it lets you combo with your Trail Hounds. For every trail hound within 3 inches of a visible enemy, you deal 3 damage. This is really cool and very damaging if you can set it up. In theory, you could just run 5 dogs and blow up a 15 wound model, or wound something far tougher, or just finish something off. There is no dice roll requirement, it just happens regardless of toughness, regardless of enemy. If you have dogs nearby, you just do that damage. This is an incredibly thinky ability that requires practice and pondering to really pull off. It is expensive as it is a triple, but it has infinite range. If your warden can see the enemy, you can declare kill and that thing gets ravaged by dogs. Learning how and when to use this ability is key as sometimes it's best to use it to kill a weakened enemy with one or two dogs to free up a model for movement. Other times you want to surround something and then nuke that thing from orbit. In any case, finding the right balance of dogs taken, dogs used and when to run the dogs in is a game in and of itself. This is super powerful and well worth it to take the trail hand warden even if you only take one or two dogs. I say this with no inkling of hyperbole, no exaggerated guff to harden your loins. The Arblista is arguably the best unit in Wildercore and possibly one of the best ranged units in the entire game. You can place an Arby down and your opponent has to do one of two things. 
kill it or play around it. This thing is expensive, soft and slow. It only has toughness and movement 3, although this is backed by a decent wounds of 12. That being said, he is also 175 points, which is a whole heap of oof. All of that being said, this guy's ranged attack is the stuff of nightmares. 2448 is bonkers. Slap on plus 1 strength for 15 points and you're looking at 2548 which is enough to put a sad face on just about anyone just before their face is blown off with a man-sized bolt. You put this guy at the back, ideally elevated to ignore cover and to get better sightlines. You then fire away all day, every day. This thing will murder so many things or mortally wound everything else. If you can get it to fire more often, it gets ludicrous. Fight for profit on a Caradon Overlord or Coordinated Strike on Kalthia Zandaya are both amazing. The more this fires, the better you will be. Oh, did we mention that this thing has range 20? This is enough to shoot literally anything on the board if you have a somewhat central position at the back of the board. Now, I am going to go out on a limb and say that you only really want one, even if they are ludicrous. They are very vulnerable to being killed by opposing range threats if they can get into range before you kill them, or just being ganked by fast moving units and reinforcements. Putting too many eggs into this basket is just bad news. Try to protect them with bodies. Give your opponent more pressing matters to deal with so that our blister can stay unmolested for as long as possible. And remember, he can always disengage on a reaction if he doesn't immediately die. Very, very powerful. There are two types of leather hides, great and absolutely fucking terrible. Right off the bat, we aren't even going to give the crossbow leather hide the time of day. This guy is straight up crap. He can't fight in melee and his range attack absolutely sucks. The Trog Slayer Spear dude though, he's pretty darn good. He's soft, again only having toughness 3 and 12 wounds and he is 100 points so he's very soft for that point level. He's okay in combat though thanks to 3424 at range 2. He has access to Hunter's Eye which brings his damage to 35 and he combos with Hunting Party beautifully. He dies very quickly but on the flip side he can do a lot of damage very quickly thanks to his incredible action economy and self buffs. I would maybe consider adding plus one strength. This makes him a little bit more expensive but lets him hit more reliably. You could also add plus one toughness or plus four wounds to make him a bit sturdier. This guy is almost good enough, heck possibly good enough, to run as the backbone of an entire list. My only concern is he pushes a very aggressive style of wilder core which I am not convinced can stand up to the crushing power of the big melee factions like Stormcast Eternals, Ogre Moor Tribes or Iron Jaws. That being said, he is well worth experimenting with. Next up we have Trailblazers and these guys come in two forms, kinda good and actually downright great. The good variant is the Dueling Saber Blazer because he does what the Leatherhide does but in a slightly different way. And of course he's also very squishy which is to be expected from the Wilder Core in general. Toughness 3 and 12 wounds just isn't going very far at all. Now he does have access to Trail Blazer's Might which lets him crit on a 5 plus which is kind of great on a 4324 profile. I just think this guy is wildly outclassed by the next guy. That guy is the twin crossbow trailblazer who loses his melee attack but gains a second crossbow. This means he has 4313 range 8 shooting with no minimum range and still retains access to trailblazer's might. What does all this mean? It means a lot of things. Firstly, you can fire 8 shots a turn from a safe distance. It also means you can fire 8 shots a turn into melee, provided that you are no more than 3 inches away from that target. It also means you can land those crits on a 5 plus pretty darn reliably, and again, you have 8 shots to do that. And finally, it also means you can combo this with Hunting Party, since you can be the instigator or the target. Having two of these guys working together allows one dude to fire 8 shots and then asking his mate to fire 4 more shots. Then his mate can feasibly go next, fire 8 shots and then ask the first guy to fire 4 more shots. That's 24 shots of 2 actions and 2 doubles. Yet the damage does suck 
but the sheer volume of fire means you will crit eventually. Weight of dice has value in and of itself, and they are only 90 points of pop, which makes them competitively priced for what you get. Even at Toughness 3, these guys have 12 wounds and their reaction. They don't often die on first contact, making them slippery and very dangerous. If something moves towards you, focus fire and then riddle them with bolts. It will die eventually, especially when you are taking 3, 4 or maybe even 5 of these guys in any given list. As is the theme with the Wildercore, the scouts come in two variants, bad and kind of acceptable. The crossbow dude is crap, leave him at home, he brings nothing but shame and dishonour to your warband. The hatchet dude though? Yeah, we like him. He is rather cheap at 75 points, has 10 wounds and toughness 3, which does make him squishy, but survivable thanks to his reaction. He has an okay melee profile for his points at 4313 and comes with a throwing axe that does 2313 at 8 inches with no minimum range, making him quite versatile for a model this cheap. I like him, I just don't think a super chaffy core to a world of core list is the way forward, but they can be handy to fill in numbers if you need to, and they can also be a pain in the butt. Now, the Trailhound is really good. For 60 points, you get a movement 6 piece. Sure, it only has toughness 3, and sure, it only has 6 wounds, but movement 6 has a lot of play and can be used to take objectives, get in the way, and generally get to where you want to be, which is very important because of the kill ability. Now, the question is, how many Trailhounds do you want to take? That answer is very tricky. You can go very heavy on trailhounds and then do some insane kill commands. This is very hard to pull off. It will result in you maybe getting one massive spike off before your opponent just kills all of your dogs and leaves you high and dry. It feels a little bit like a trap to go that heavy. So that leaves me with the impression that you really want to have as many dogs as you can fit in a single battle group whilst also having your warden in that same battle group. Any more dogs than that and you're getting into the realm of not being able to make full use of kill. With this setup, say two to three dogs and a warden in a battle group, you can just pop onto the board, run up and deal six to nine damage, not including any damage from your dogs, which are fairly decent at two, three, two, three. As a reinforcement battle group, this is especially cool because a common tactic is to block reinforcements. If enemies do that with a Kill Warden Hound group, they are asking for trouble right off the bat. Remember, Kill has a 3 inch effect radius, so you don't need your dogs in combat to use it. So you can stay out of range, pop this, do your damage, and then maybe just run away. Finally, they have their own ability, and one that is kind of cool. Basically, if on your next attack action you land one hit, then you remove one action from your opponent. If they have no actions, you do 3 damage instead. This is an okay way to get a little bit more damage on an opponent or to strip a powerful enemy of their actions. The downside is that dogs only get 2 attacks and they are only strength 3 and the effect does not trigger on a crit. Remember, in Warcry, hits and crits are different things. If you roll too well, this does nothing. It's a cool ability, it's thematic, is unfortunately outclassed by both Hunter's Eye and Hunting Pack for doubles, sadly. And that is all of the units and their abilities covered. It is time to look at some allies and what they would bring to the table. There are a few that really stand out and in some cases I'll be using very broad strokes since their ally game, at least for me, seems quite basic and your warband likes to do what it does. It likes itself a lot and you don't want to overshadow that. You want to improve that, nurture it, make a loving plastic daddy. And yeah, we're going to start with the obvious. Uh, the Caradon Overlords are dickheads of the highest order. They are a nightmare to play against and that is in part due to their incredibly powerful triple, Fight for Profit. All of the heroes can use it, so pick one you like and then throw them in there. Ether Chemists, Company Captains, Admirals, all these guys are great. Fight for Profit increases the number of attacks your guys do within 3 inches by 1. If your dude is carrying treasure or is on an objective, they get plus 2 attacks. Unlike Onslaught, this doesn't just buff melee attacks. 
it buffs all attacks. This makes everything better. Your RB getting 3 to 4 shots per action, your Trailblazers getting 5 to 6 shots, your Spearmen getting 5 to 6 stabs. This is all good stuff and you love to see it. Not only that, many of these guys are very cheap so you can splash without breaking the bank. The only downside is that they are very slow. They are very static and this encourages a very stationary playstyle to get the most out of them. This can cause issues against a savvy opponent so bear that in mind. Hey look, an order video talking about Kalthia Zandaya. Who would have thought? Kalthia Zandaya is Caradon Overlords version 2 when it comes to Wildercore. The Caradon Overlords are the obvious pick. They directly buff your range stuff and make it awesome. Kalthia Zandaya does the same thing but to less models at a greater cost. So why take her? Kalthia Zandaya's coordinated strike also allows for movement. It allows for bonus attacks, not just augmented stats. It's more versatile. It encourages a more proactive playstyle. You are manipulating your action economy, not maximizing your individual actions themselves. Fight for Profit only makes you attack better. Kalthia allows your guys to move when they need to move and attack when and where they need to attack. It also has a whopping 9 inch range, not 3 inches, letting you support a larger portion of the board. All of this, and we haven't even gotten into what she brings as a model, her stat block. She's solid in combat with 5424, 4. she's fast at movement 5, and with toughness 5 and 25 wounds, she's by far the toughest thing in your list. She is 210 points, which is expensive but she is very competitively priced for the utility and power she brings. She is very good in Wildercore and well worth that investment. There is a reason Kalthia Zandaya appears time and time and time again. Lastly, we have Stormcast Eternal Paladins and not one specific paladin, we literally mean any paladin you like. These guys are basically all movement 3, all toughness 6 and they're all good in combat. You pick the one you like, we like Grand Hammer Annihilators, but literally all of them fit. They tend to be around the 180 to 200 points range, and taking one is kind of great if you want something that can just soak damage and kick the crap out of whatever you need killing. They are slow, so you could just use them as a bodyguard for your Arbalist. Put it this way, people want to kill your Arbalist. Put a Grand Hammer nearby or in front of the Arbalist, and they are forced to deal with your dude's devastating blows if they want to take on your ranged threat. That's a scary proposition for most things. If they don't kill the Arbalist, you disengage for free, then you have your hammer dude clap them back so hard they won't be able to move for weeks. When it comes to list building, there are a few ways to run Wildercore, but I do think that epic levels of useless variance does pressure you into using a very narrow selection of guys and then that leads to lists feeling a little bit by the numbers. That's not a bad thing necessarily, it's just a thing. So let's look at our first list. This one focuses more on uh, the kill command, more on Unga Bunga. This is melee and hard hitting things that are supported by a ranged threat. This list is 1000 points on the nose and comes in at 10 models. You have enough models here to run a four man battle group and that is your warden group 100% of the time. You have your warden and your three dogs and then you use your kill command for a burst of nine over and over again which is very very nice. People will feel that and they will not ignore that. Now your Arbalist isn't supported with buffs but it does have the plus one strength blessing and that is all you need because he is great like this regardless of bonus actions or bonus shots. He gives your list real threat projection and you can defend him with your Trog Slayers and maybe even your Rune Lord. Now speaking of the Rune Lord, this guy is here because he has sticking potential. He is the toughest thing in this list and he can use over my dead body on a double to count as three models on objectives. This guy is great for securing territory and ensuring people can't easily take your stuff. He can't fight all that well and he won't survive a dedicated beating, but he fills a nice role in this list as a little bit of throwaway tech. 
then you have your core, your spearmen. These guys do good damage. They hit hard, they can buff, they can use hunting party and they have range 2 on their attacks, making them a little bit harder to kill and they synergize with their reaction very, very well. Now, you can swap out those spearmen with trailblazers, with sabers. Those guys aren't very solid. They get more attacks, lower strength, but access to 5 plus crits, which is kind of awesome. My issue with those guys are that they are ranged 1, making them quite vulnerable to death. So I'm not quite sold on them over the spearmen, but they are absolutely worth experimenting with. And they are 10 points cheaper model, giving you more points for blessings. And this is the off meta kicked my ass with a variant of this list list. Me and off meta musings had a game a few weeks back where he ran a variant of this list, possibly this exact same list. I am not entirely sure. I recreated this by accident on Warcryer and it does seem to be very similar, if not identical. So shout out to off meta for incepting this into my brain. Again, check out his channel and his video. I am certain that that is a masterclass on how to play Wildeco. Now this list has one Warden with Doggo, one Arblister with plus one strength, four Trailblazers with twin crossbows, two Trailhounds and Kalthia Zandaya. This is a nine model warband and it has a little bit of everything. It is Wildeco distilled into a very tasty soup. Heinz extra chunky, maybe a Scotch broth. You run this with your Warden and two dogs in one group, your Arblister, a Blazer and Calthia in another group and then your remaining Blazers go into your final group. Customise the exact group symbols based on your mission pack and you will have a good time. Your Warden and dogs are there for kill, they are there for objective stuff. We haven't got overboard with the nonsense here, we did exactly what we said we would do and that's take as many as we can fit into a group with a Warden. Having 6 damage on command on a triple is quite strong. It's also not dice value dependent, it ignores all toughness and it doesn't require a hit roll. You can use this to swoop in and munch on a near dead chap who has just been clobbered by the Arbalist. Speaking of which, this guy now has strength 5. So he is putting holes in most things. Average toughness in Warcry is only 4. So now you are hitting on 3 plus the majority of the time and that 3 plus is nasty when you have 4 8 damage. Calthia is nearby and even on the worst possible triple can allow the Arblister to fire a third time. The better the triple, the more units you can buff. Getting a Trailblazer to fire 4 more shots is kind of awesome too, as is just getting nearby dogs to move and to get where they need to be. It's all good stuff. Then you have your Blazers and these guys are great. The moment anything approaches you are in a great position to fire into combat and just delete things. Toughness doesn't really matter when you are firing this many shots. We are talking in an ideal scenario without any buffs, 32 shots a turn that can go into combat and they can't be countered. Hunting Party and Calthia bring that number right up. Trust me when I say even tanky Stormcast can't withstand that much firepower for long. They will start to fall down when the focus firing begins. And all of this is just talking about damage and doing sneaky damage stuff. Games aren't just one with damage. In objective games you need to be mobile and thankfully you are. Calthia is movement 5. Everyone else is movement 4 and their reaction lets them dip out of combat and potentially forward in the process. Dogs are movement 6. Standing still and shooting can only take you so far and I can wax lyrical about the damage output of this list but it requires a keen hand to pilot effectively. You have to maximise your action economy, not get tied up in combat. Manage your distances perfectly. Take out the right targets at the right time. You are soft. Toughness 3 is terrible, most of your guys have 12 wounds, they will die eventually and once you start dying, you lose massive chunks of your damage output. A trailblazer dying is not just a lost activation, but 8 inches of movement, 8 plus shots, a hunting party target. If your arbalister dies, you lose all of your super high value threat projection. You have to play smart. In conclusion, Will the Core are really cool. Another masterclass of bespoke design by Games Workshop in this latest 
string of releases. These guys are hunters of Huanxi version 2 and they take what hunters do and they make them slower but far more effective and honestly far more enjoyable on the table, at least for me. They are squishy but not too squishy. They are good in melee when they have to be. They have insane threat projection. They have excellent overlapping firepower and ranged nonsense that is just a blast to mess with. Despite being easier to grasp than Hunters of Huanxi, they are still hard however. These have a high skill flow and you will likely need some practice to really get the most out of them. That practice will pay off in droves because they are a lot of fun and very rewarding to play. I mean, these are just regular dudes and their pets in a game filled with demons, monsters, immortal thunder warriors and thrice cursed followers of chaos. It's just a cool theme. Now, my only real criticism here is the box. The box is currently locked behind the hunter and hunted set, which also comes with the Gorja more pack. This makes it very expensive to start since you are buying two warbands. Sure, the gorgeous are great, loads of fun, but if you aren't interested, then you are buying models you just don't want. We also don't know when these models will get a solo release, which isn't great. And that ties into my next issue, and that is the box itself. This box has a lot of models in it, but not enough ways to build the models you actually want. You want a lot of spears, you want a lot of twin crossbows, the box doesn't give you enough of these models to make as many as you would maybe want in a standard list. Currently, this means buying at the very least two boxes of this very expensive double warband box, or being shafted on eBay, or converting your own. None of these options are ideal since not everyone has the money to splash on opulent, poorly packaged boxes, or the desire, scale, or just confidence to convert. Bear all that in mind before you dive headlong into this set. And that is the end of the video. If you made it this far, you are an absolute legend. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe for more content. A huge thank you to everyone who has signed up to my Patreon and YouTube members. Their names are on screen right now. Sign up to join them. A special shout out goes to our algorithmic demon slayers. Kitty Cowan, Prakamakul, and Brioche. Until next time, lads, ladies, and everybody in between and beyond. Ta-ra.